morning, everybody. Good morning. As we do each week, I hope you can hear me since I don't have a microphone. As we do each week, we light the candle that is a representative of Christ in our midst. As we know, Christ was considered the light of the world. We remember how the prophet said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And while we know that God is always with us, we remember the words of Jesus from our tradition that say, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So as we gather today, Christ is in our midst, and we are in the midst of Christ. And when we extinguish the candle at the end of the service, the light does not go out because you all take it with you. We want to welcome you today to Bloom in the Desert Ministries. We are, a, we are committed to being an affirming an open congregation affirming everyone here and expressing in our life together the modern motto of our United Church of Christ, which says, whoever you are and wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. You welcome everybody, no matter your gender, your creed, your sexual orientation, your the way you express your sexuality, black, white, golf players, tennis players, we don't care, everybody is welcome here. Now is the time to transition to our worship. We have been scattered in body, mind, and spirit throughout the work, and perhaps even this morning. So let us now gather in worship. As people have done for eons, we bring our hearts and minds and souls and strength together in the worship of God and care for each other. Opening prayer. Christ is with us. Christ, Christ is in our midst. Let us pray. O oh God, it is isn't yet near, we gather as witnesses to your promise, that if we seek with you all our hearts, we will find you. Be among us this day, hear the yearnings of our hearts, help us change the narrowness of our vision and the readiness of our living. Make us new again in your holy grace. Grant us the maturity to accept your gifts assurance that even those things that are hidden from memory or are too deep for our words are not beyond God's love or forgiveness. God, who knows us completely, bestows pardon and peace. Amen. 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 Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from Psalms. It is Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for God will speak peace to God's people, to God's faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who revere God, that God's glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness or justness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and the righteousness and righteousness will look down from the heavens. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Justness will go before God, and will make a path for God's steps. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. Good morning. Please rise if you are able for the reading of the gospel. The 
gospel reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But he was a righteous and holy man and he protected him. When Herod heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet Herod liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter by Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. <clears throat> the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of this, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here is the reading of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Enjoy all that whispering. I think you probably are having the same reaction yeah. to the gospel <laughs> that I did. <laughs> well, good morning again, church. Good morning. It has been a while since I last worshiped with you, and it is always good to come home. A few weeks ago, uh, I had what was for me an opportunity to experience something that I never even considered adding to my bucket list. Vacationing in Paris, France. <laughs> Visiting the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, and the grounds of Versailles. Now, I visited the grounds because we didn't realize that the castle wouldn't be open on the day that we were there, but we still enjoyed ourselves on the grounds. What a whirlwind. And then two days after returning to the U.S., I spent 10 very hot triple-digit days for a baseball tournament that my grandson was taking part in. And those triple digits were in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh. And they reached 114 degrees. Now, I thought, I was going to have sort of that reaction, oh, how horrible. And then I found out that Palm Springs reached temperatures to 117, so oh. <laughs> no sympathy for me. <laughs> Phoenix, though, brought two challenges. First, the heat, and secondly, the suggested gospel passage that we heard this morning. <coughs> As a matter of fact, while in Phoenix, when I peruse the lectionary scriptures for today, I must confess 
I was disappointed in the selection because it was difficult for me to wrap my head around, and especially since I, I, I wanted to deliver what I felt would be a nice, uplifting Christian <laughs> message. <laughs> I didn't find that that particular passage fit the bill. Nevertheless, I must also consider or confess that while in Arizona, misguided thoughts occurred to me. I thought perhaps I should disregard the lectionary selection and simply decide to choose a different and less challenging passage. However, in the past, I have always followed the lectionary because I realized if I trust that, and we have the sign somewhere, God is still speaking, following the lectionary will encourage me to explore a different way to hear and to experience what God may be saying to me and what God may want me to hear. So church, I'm just hoping you can hang in there with me as I deliver what I have received with regard to this most challenging gospel passage. Admittedly, thinking about choosing a different gospel passage has little to do with today's scripture other than the idea of linking personal misguided thoughts to decision making. The specific reason behind my disappointment was because when I read the lectionary verses of Mark's gospel, I was surprised as well as dismayed that other than verse 14, this particular segment says very little about Jesus. You know, preaching is so much easier when Jesus is the stated focal point. However, for today, I think that you and I need to count on Jesus' all-encompassing spirit to work within us as we engage this passage. You see, what has been revealed to me is as we seek comprehension, when we open our hearts and our minds to receive his guidance, Jesus can prevail, even if his name isn't articulated. And that is what we are called to do. What effect would the spirit of Jesus want us to experience when hearing about such a horrific, selfish, and uncaring ruler? Faithful resolve to seek Justice are words that come to mind. Some commentators note that today's scripture is presented as a foreshadowing of Jesus' life and death. Many other commentators suggest this passage is included in order to demonstrate how John the Baptist was revered by his many, for his dedication and by his devoted followers, revered for his strength and teachings, but more significantly for his humility in understanding that Jesus was the true one, the true prophet to be followed. To that end, it is helpful to read the beginning of Mark's gospel to understand a possible message found in today's passage. If we go back to Mark 1, verses 77 and 8, we read, quote, He, meaning John, proclaimed, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you, us, with the Holy Spirit. 
Mark's wording was intended for the readers to note the comparison between John and Jesus. No doubt these explanations are important to retain, but there are more insights to consider. In that first chapter, Mark depicts the similarities between Jesus' and John's ministries of devotion to righteousness, and I notice that our congregation loves to say, to justice. While at the same time, Mark reminds us that Jesus' devotion and teachings are even deeper and more closely connected to God's will for humankind. These similarities are intended to counter, <coughs> excuse me, to, to counter the accepted cultural practices of their day. I want to read that again. These similarities are intended to counter the accepted cultural practices of their day. But even more poignantly, Mark wants us to remember the unrighteous cruelty of Jesus' and John's deaths, authorized by Herod. In today's passage, there is another comparison. With respect to John the Baptist, we hear of righteousness and holiness, but with regard to Herod, Antipas, ruler of Galilee, son of Herod the Great, we hear of seduction, fear, false arrests, imprisonment, false imprisonment, and murder. We observed a corrupt and contemptible leader ruling or unjustly governing a society which is hungering for peace and justice. The whole Herodian family lived unscrupulously and selfishly, only desiring to bring pleasure for themselves. Only desiring to, be, to bring pleasure and adoration for themselves. Further, even though he was merely a subject of the emperor of Rome, Herod considered himself and wanted to be thought of as king, maintaining all the authority and the sense of superiority and privilege that goes along with that title. Are you hearing me, church? Amen. This King Herod, who at the request of a charming dancer, because of misguided promise, a misguided promise that he made to her, callously sent one of his soldiers to the prison with orders to bring him John the Baptist's head. John, who was innocently in prison simply because he spoke the truth. This is the very same ruler that cowardly allowed Jesus' crucifixion. I have entitled today's sermon, Misguided Promises. You see, church, accepting or following through with misguided promises can corrupt paths to righteousness and become embedded in one's soul. The more I delved into the background of Herod, the more discouraged I became. I learned about the treatment the ruling class thrust upon the others. You know, church, the poor, the mourners, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those persecuted for seeking righteousness, the meek, the merciful, the pure of heart, the peacemakers, the ones Jesus would embrace as they strove to live righteously because he knew that their lives were worthy of God's love. 
the ones who didn't belong to the elite class or the ruling class, the ones John the Baptist was trying to lift up by encouraging them to repent and seek righteousness. This scripture tells us that Herod was perplexed. Even though he liked what he heard when John preached, Herod wouldn't allow himself to rise above his cultural practices. He couldn't pull away from the misguided promises he was accustomed to. I might even add those misguided promises that he grew up believing. He clung to the opinion that whatever he wanted for himself was right and he couldn't or wouldn't change. The ruler and his cohorts were the ones who benefited from Herod's misguided promises. Promises which were made to please the powers to be without regard to the harm inflicted upon the ones hungering for peace and justice. Herod made his misguided promise simply in order not to be embarrassed and to save face before his guests and his misguided promise ended John the Baptist's life. There is so much cruelty and injustice in this passage, it's difficult to find anything positive to preach about. But, but church, I did find a few hopeful words. Verse 26. The king was deeply grieved. Although Herod chose to disregard his grief, the mention of his grieving suggests something within him was stirred. And that fleeting moment of grief was a sign that he was capable of empathy had he chosen to acknowledge it and to act justly. The lesson I want us to realize is a contrast to Herod's response. The compassionate stirring from within ourselves is a righteous, and it is a righteousness we are being called to attend and must not be frivolously or selfishly ignored. The compassionate stirring from within ourselves is a righteousness we are being called to attend and must not be frivolously or selfishly ignored. What misguided promises do we accept for ourselves? What are we willing to overlook so we don't become embarrassed if we speak up? Church, it seems as if nowadays we are inundated and can be overwhelmed with simple problems, with a multiple of problems and issues in our country, in our world, and in our lives. A partial list includes racism, the degrading of a people since the inception of our country, homophobia, refusal to acknowledge love is God's gift offered for all to experience. Immigration, zero tolerance, callously taking children away from their parents without caring about the resulting pain, 
Mark 9, verse 37 reads, Jesus said, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but the one who sent me. Loss of women's rights. Prohibiting women from making their own decisions about their bodies. Homelessness. Families. The mentally ill and veterans not able to afford housing or receive needed care. Hunger. Families lacking the necessary resources to buy food for everyone in their home. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I better get a little water. I don't know where this came from, but it's... <coughs> instead of improving it, leaves many without coverage. Religious discrimination, ignoring Jesus' teaching to love our neighbors, which could possibly even include our neighbors that practice other religions. And you can add caring about our earth to that list. Certainly we can't right all the wrongs we find in the world, but the least we can do is speak up. Use our voices to speak truth to power. In many instances, bloomers are doing just that. <coughs> My plea to you is don't get weary Church, your courage is sorely needed. As followers of Jesus, we must force ourselves to make sure we don't slip into the model of Herod by ignoring the tug at our heart that is encouraging us to do the right and might, I say, the righteous thing. When misguided promises are made that cause harm, we have a responsibility to courageously, to courageously, and it takes courage, to reject those promises. This may sometimes require us to learn about and accept truths that have been previously concealed or distorted so that we accept the status quo that advantages some and disadvantages others. There are ways and there is our responsibility to learn about past pain that has been caused by some of our misguided promises. Sort of an aside, I donated two books to our library. And I encourage you to try and read, read them. I learned so much more about our country and the pain that we have given to others. And it will open our eyes. Herod didn't have the courage to displease his cultural base even though they were expecting him to take the life of a prophet who Herod secretly admired and understood that he was a righteous man. That very same righteous and holy man realized that Jesus was the true one. Jesus spoke truth to power. Church, which one of the issues in that partial listing requires our voices to follow Jesus' example of speaking truth to power? When we examine this list, 
Note that all of these issues are created by an uncaring and indifferent segment of humankind who selfishly advance their own agenda with misguided promises. What is revealed is there are some who are not willing to share their privileges. How do we maintain our faith under such dire circumstances? We can remember who it is that we put our faith in. I'd like to share with you a few words from one of my favorite authors, the late Reverend William Sloan Coffin. And he wrote, quote, Jesus is both a mirror to our humanity and a window to divinity. A window revealing as much of God as is given mortal eyes to see. When Christians see Christ empowering the weak, scorning the powerful, healing the wounded, and judging their tormentors, we are seeing transparently the power of God at work. What is finally important is not that Christ is godlike, but God is Christ-like. God is like Christ. That's what we need to know, isn't it, he writes? Then we know how to pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gives us the right and confidence to pray the way we do. Coffin also reminds us in his time on earth, Jesus stood tall, but not by making others cringe. He had power, but used it solely to empower others. He healed, but with no strings attached. He competed with none, loved all, even when we were least lovable, even to the point of dying on the cross for us." End quote. Church, Jesus is our model, our role model, and his promises were not misguided. He understood grief. He grieved when he heard of the false imprisonment and execution of John the Baptist. He grieved when he saw prejudice and discrimination. Think of the Good Samaritan. He grieved when the women were treated as, quote, less than. Remember Mary Magdalene? But he used his grief to motivate and inspire righteousness and justice. He lived in a political world that didn't care about the Don Trodden, the Don Trodden. But he spoke up. We too can speak up and stand tall when we do our best to receive his spirit into our heart and we do our best to allow, his, to allow his spirit to govern our decisions. Jesus' life was lived to bring us into God's loving realm. Trusting his promises can bring us a sense of inner peace and strengthen our faith and motivate our actions. Amen. 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 Gracious God, we ask you to accept these offerings now placed on your altar. O oh God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, grant that they may be symbols of our love and of ourselves, now offered more fully to you. Amen. 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 Please now let us be most comfortable to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of forever. Amen. Thank you.